Today I want to talk to you about a very important subject. Parashat Terumah. At the beginning of this parasha, the focus is on a very important topic, which is the subject of giving, of giving charity. And the Torah speaks about the charity that the Jewish people should be giving to the building of the Mishkan. And this money, or whatever they're donating, the Torah says, is expected to come from their heart. Asher yidebenu libo. You have to want to give. I think probably all of us have heard many, many important dirashot on the subject of charity, especially in Parashat Terumah. What maybe we have not paid attention to is the first Rashi that discusses the different types of Terumah that the beginning of the parasha is discussing. We thought, when we read the parasha, that we're talking about one type of gift, money to build Mishkan. However, as she tells us, that over here, there are three types of terumah. They were collecting for three things. Number one, they were collecting silver to make the sockets that they put the pillars of the Mishkan, the wooden boards that they put in the Mishkan, they put them, on pill they put them in sockets. These were heavy silver sockets. This was a collection made special for them. Each person, each and every person had to give mahasit shekel half of a shekel of silver for the sockets. That was an obligation. They didn't ask you if you wanted to give, if you had a heart to give. They said you have to give, obligation. Says Rashi, the second collection was for purchasing animals to bring korbanot throughout the year. They had a collection where they kept animals throughout the year ready to put them on the Mizbeah. That was also an obligation. Also, half a shekel. Every single person must give half a shekel. The third collection, the third terumah, is the collection for building the Mishkan. It is this one that the Torah says is not an obligation. This one they can give only if they want to give. So one more time. In this, that's why it says the word teruma three times. Ve'yikhuli teruma, tikhu et terumati, ve'zota teruma. Three times you see teruma in the beginning, in the first two pesukim, three pesukim, excuse me, because there were three different collections. Again, the first collection for the adanim, the sockets, was mandatory. The second collection for the korbanot, for the animals, was mandatory. And the third collection for the building of the mishkan, that was only by choice, if a person wanted to. The question is, why, when discussing the main collection that we know about, that the Torah gives 
the most attention to in this parasha is the one that has to do with the building of the Mishkan, the third one. Why over here are the other collections mentioned, the ones that you have to do? The focus should be strictly on the collection for the Mishkan, which was done voluntary. The answer to this question is a very important principle in Judaism. The Gemara in Masechet Kiddushin asks, who deserves a greater reward? A person who does a mitzvah out of obligation because they have to? Someone is forcing them to do it? Or if someone does a mitzvah voluntarily, on their own, without anyone forcing them. So the Gemara makes a very surprising statement. It says, Gadol metzuve ve'ose. The person who does mitzvot out of obligation is greater than the one who volunteers. If I'm obligated to do something and I do it, it's greater than if I was doing it voluntarily on my own without anyone forcing me. That seems to be a very surprising statement. We would have thought the exact opposite. Imagine, for example, for example, Imagine you have a father who commands his son, get me water right now. Get me a cup of tea right now. And the son goes and brings his father a cup of water. Or imagine the son that sees that his father is eating and when he's eating, he usually likes to drink. And on his own, without even his father mentioning anything, he goes and he brings his father a cup of water or a cup of tea, whatever it might be. Surely if I was my, the father, I would say, wow. On the second one, I would say, look how my son brought something on his own without me having to tell him anything. If I have to tell him and he brought it, I don't know if I would have that same feeling. Certainly the love that my son has for me is on greater display when he does things on his own voluntarily. When I force him to do it and he does it, I don't know that it shows so much love. He's forced, he has to do it. He's not rebellious. But it doesn't show that he loves me. But when on his own, he looked at what I need and he went and he got it. He didn't have to. That shows a tremendous amount of love. But the Gemara says the opposite. The Gemara says that greater is the one who is commanded and does than the one who does it voluntarily. That means... If a person is obligated to sit in the sukkah, like a man, every one of us, let's say it's a little bit chilly out. The halakha says, you must sit in the sukkah. And the person goes outside with his coat and he sits to eat in the sukkah. He does a mitzvah. And then you have a woman. A woman is not obligated to sit in the sukkah. But she gets a mitzvah if she does. She could sit inside with her daughters, with her mother, with her sister-in-laws. They have a beautiful table set up and they're all sitting there. And this woman decides on her own, you know what? Even though I don't have to, but I want to. I'm going to go do the mitzvah. I'm going to sit outside with the men. I'm going to put my coat on and sit outside in the cold and eat in the sukkah. 
If we would have looked at that scene, we would have said, wow, this woman is some righteous woman. The fact that the men are sitting and eating makes sense. They have to. They have no choice. But the woman who didn't have to, and she went on her own to do this without anyone forcing her. There's no avera, there's no problem. That's a tremendous amount of love that she's showing for the mitzvot. Yet the Gemara says the opposite. The Gemara says that when you look at that scene, the men eating there are greater than the woman. Because they're doing it out of obligation. And she's doing it voluntarily. It's totally opposite what we would think. It's against our logic. How could this be? Doesn't the woman display greater love because she's doing it without anyone forcing her? Where are we wrong on this? So I want to give you the classic answer to this question. But it's a lot deeper than we think. The classic answer to this question, and even on the surface, it's a very powerful answer. And it certainly applies to every person in this room, especially young men of your age. Hazal tell us, and I think we clearly see this in our lives, that when a person is being told what to do, there is resistance. As free humans, independent thinkers, freedom lovers, we love freedom. We love to do what we want to do. And the minute somebody tells us, do this, there's resistance. There's that little person in the back of the mind saying, hey, who are you to tell me what to do? You think I'm your slave? You think my opinion doesn't count? You think you control me? Every time we are told to do something, there's that little voice in our mind that says, who do you think you are that you can tell me what to do and take away my freedom? There's a story of a young man who one week during Gemara class was having the best week. He was at every class listening, involved, So his rabbi came to him after the end of the week. He says, wow. He says, Yosef, what a week. What a week. You were involved, you were learning, you were happy, you were, it was great. He says, I'm very proud of you. He says, you know, keep it up. So the student tells his rabbi, he says, rabbi, don't worry. Next week, I'll be back to my old lazy self. So he says, why? He says, why, Yosef? Doesn't it feel good to put your effort to learn something? You're participating, you're enjoying, you're alive. You're understanding what's going on. Why would you not want to keep it up? So the student tells his Rebbe, he says, listen, this week I'm only learning because the principal's on vacation. I have nobody telling me what to do. Nobody's walking through the halls. The administration is away. He says, therefore, I have a feeling of freedom, of independence. I'm happy to learn this week. But once they come back and they walk the halls and they tell me I have to go to class and I have to learn, he says, I put my head down, I'm out. That's an exaggerated story 
of reality that we live every single day. Every one of us. When we do things on our own, we feel good. When we're being told what to do, even if it's good, we'd rather sometimes not listen and do our own thing. So that's why a person who acts out of obligation is greater. Because he is fighting that resistance. The resistance of, who are you to tell me? A person who acts voluntarily, he has no resistance. For example, by the case of the woman in the sukkah, the woman in the sukkah has nobody telling her what to do. So she's doing it because she wants to do it. She's happy to do it. It's her own mind making decisions. But the man who's sitting there, it's not his own mind deciding. He's being told what to do. And when you're being told what to do, you're not happy doing it, generally speaking. And he's still doing it, even though he doesn't want to do it per se on his own. That deserves a greater reward. 